Good morning. How's the family this morning? Besides a little wet, maybe? There you go. Oh, yeah, I still got to do the tissue thing. I just, I'm still hopping along a little bit, but it's getting better. Well, are you ready? Here we go. Nick sang it. <laughs> this morning, I want to present everyone with just a simple question. Have you ever had doubt about something in your life? I don't think anyone here is exempt from that, that, that we all find ourselves having doubt at one time or another. You know, the doubt that we have many times comes from uh, just our thinking, letting our mind just Satan get in our head sometimes and gives us a doubt about things. You know, doubt like this illness I have, will I ever be cured from it? I doubt that I'm ever going to get out of this financial bind I'm in. I doubt my kids will ever amount to anything. I've heard it all. The big one is I doubt God hears my prayers. With that doubt going on in our lives, we never find ourselves moving forward in some things that we need to move forward in. Our doubt in our minds tend to hold us back from time to time. A defendant was on trial for murder in Oklahoma. There was, a strong, there was strong evidence indicating guilt, but there was no corpse to be found. In the defense closing statement, the lawyer knowing that his client would probably be convicted resorted to a trick. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I have a surprise for all of you. The lawyer said as he looked at his watch, within one minute, the person presumed dead in this case will walk into this courtroom. He looked toward the courtroom door. The jurors, somewhat stunned, all looked eagerly. A minute passed and nothing happened. Finally, the lawyer said, actually, I made up the previous statement. But you all looked with anticipation. I therefore put it to you that there is reasonable doubt in this case as to whether anyone was killed and insist that you return a verdict of not guilty. The jury, jury clearly confused, retired to deliberate. A few minutes later, they, the jury returned and pronounced a verdict of guilty. But how, inquired the lawyer, you must have had some doubt. I saw all of you stare at the door. The jury foreman said, oh, we did look at the door, but your client didn't. Amen. Amen. Everybody had doubt right then, right? But the client didn't. So that's a, that's a good sign of uh, a guilt. And today, we're going to talk a little bit about doubt in our lives, and we're going to talk about one of the most famous people in the Bible, Doubting Thomas, and the doubt that we tend to have in our lives also. Does anyone here know Thomas by any other name except Doubting Thomas? Probably not. It seems that maybe Thomas, he kind of got a bum rap in this whole thing, right? Whenever someone mentions Thomas from the Bible, they don't just say Thomas. They always say Doubting Thomas. You know, it's as if there's a bunch of Thomases in the Bible, and they want to make sure we get a hold of the right one, right? But to be honest with you, there's only one Thomas mentioned in the Bible, in the entire Bible. So why do we put that on him? And Thomas wasn't all that doubtful. We find in the Bible where he played a bigger role than just doubting. But he has been labeled with that name, and he just, you know, never could get away from it. Let's do it. Looking at the story in John chapter 11, where Jesus is headed to Bethany, and the disciples are afraid of the Pharisees right here. They know there's a real possibility that Jesus could be killed. Now, we're going to pick up in John chapter 11, verse 1, if you join me there this morning. The reason that Jesus is heading back to Bethany is because he's been told that Lazarus has died. And he's ready to go back. And he tells his disciples he's, in, he's just asleep, but they don't understand what's going on with this whole thing. And they're afraid for Jesus to go. They're afraid he could be killed. But they're not only afraid for Jesus, but they're afraid for their, themselves also. And in this story, it's where Thomas is the one that speaks up 
and says that he's willing to go to Bethany even if it means dying with Jesus. So we're going to pick up John chapter 11, beginning at verse 1, if everyone's there with me. It says, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters went, <clears throat> the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days, and then he said to his disciples, Let's go back to Judah. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you're going back. Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by the world, world's light. It's when a person walks at night, they stumble, for they have no light. After he said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I am glad. I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas, right here, Thomas, also as Didymus said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. So right here, Thomas is showing being courageous, right? He's showing that he is 100% committed to Jesus. So, you know, even though he doubts, evidently he had something going on there. Evidently he had some kind of faith or belief that, that in Jesus. And even though he had some doubt, he was willing to go and die for Jesus. The nickname, Doubting Thomas, stuck with Thomas because of a single event. One single event. Complete, they completely missed all the other things that Thomas was known for, but that one event got him labeled with a nickname. Many of us here today have nicknames, right? And there, we're probably labeled for some unexpected event or some crazy event that happened in our lives, and that gets us nicknamed that way. Uh, many of you... Uh, you know, nicknames are usually given in the memory of some kind of unflattering situation that might have happened in our lives, right? So we begin to get nicknames that way. And many of us have had a nickname in the past, and many of us still are called by that nickname today by many, amen? It just We just can't get away from it. And if you were sitting here today, right now you're probably reflecting back on that nickname you were called at one time. But why couldn't Thomas be given a nickname from the other events in his life? Why wasn't he presented a nickname for that? Such is what he said in 1 John. I don't know what he said in John 11 about being ready to die for Jesus. Why didn't they call him ready to die Thomas, right? Why didn't they, why didn't they pick up right there? Because he showed courage. And he could have been called anything else. In, in John 21, when the group of disciples were heading out on a boat, Fishing, the resurrected Christ appeared on the shoreline. It's right here, right here. Thomas is the one who first recognized him and pointed him out to all the others. Thomas, doubting Thomas. Why didn't they call him Eagle Eye Thomas? Man, he spotted him in a minute, right? Why didn't they give him some other name? Well, Thomas was not always seen in a negative way but became known more for his travels after the resurrected Christ. Thomas left Jerusalem and traveled all the way to India in his efforts to spread the good news. Started traveling and spreading the good news. Now, this is the same man that had doubts before. You see, Thomas wasn't his real name. Many of you may not know that. Didymus means twins, so they don't really mention a twin in the Bible, but that wasn't his real name, and you're going to be if you don't know, you're going to be amazed at what his real name was. But his real name was Judas. Many anyone know that? Some people may not. I didn't. How would you like to be a disciple with Jesus named Judas? No wonder he left for India. 
No wonder he used his nickname. He didn't mind doubting Thomas. That's better than Judas, right? So he didn't mind at all. One thing that Judas Ezra caught and Judas Thomas had in common was they both had their doubts. They were a lot alike in their doubts, like many of the others. Many scholars think that Judas truly believed that, you know, Judas Ezrakot believed that Jesus was the Messiah. He really believed in Jesus, but clearly had a misconception about him, which is common to a lot of people and was common to a lot of people in his day, a misconception. He believed that Jesus would lead a military revolt against Rome. He also trusted that Jesus was a great leader. He believed that and that he would be victorious in this revolt. So you say, then why did he, why did he sell Jesus out? Why would he do that? Because he had some doubts. It appears that Judas did not trust Jesus to carry out the task on his own or in his own time. He thought he had to help Jesus. He doubted that Jesus was going to get it done in the way that it needed to be done. And he doubted that he was going to get it done in his timing. So it's believed that Judas decided that he would engineer Jesus' arrest in order to create a confrontation to force Jesus to do something. Rather, it wasn't happening fast enough for him. He wanted something to happen. He believed in Jesus, and he believed that Jesus was the Messiah, and he believed Jesus could do all this, but he wasn't getting it done quick enough. It wasn't happening quick enough. So Judas decided, let's kind of put it on my, my timing instead of, instead of God's timing. I'm going to put it on mine, and I'm going to speed things up. That's where the arrest came in. That's why he betrayed Jesus. But the other Judas, Thomas, on the other hand, suffered from the lack of understanding. His doubt came from understanding, not understanding everything that was going on. And he was very careful when he sought advice or he listened to things. He also knew Jesus was an earthly ruler. He knew that. But when Jesus was executed, it became extremely difficult for him. All at once, he had all this to believe Jesus would never be executed. Jesus was the Messiah. Nothing could happen to him. So all that was pulled right out from under him. So all at once, you go from this great faith and this great belief to doubting whether any of this was true, which in the end, and at the time, the disciples missed what prophecy was at that time. His entire relationship with Jesus had ended that day he was executed. And his entire approach to faith had been thrown into a mess, into turmoil. He really didn't know what to think anymore. Wouldn't we at the same? If something changed like that, we had so much faith in something, and the rug was pulled out from under us, wouldn't we begin to doubt? When we begin to have second thoughts on things, have you ever done something, moved forward with it, and it kind of blew up in your face, and then you start to doubt, should I ever got into this? Sure we do. Every one of us have been there. And it's okay to be extremely cautious, or cautious as Thomas was, but if you have that much doubt, you'll never move forward. Don't we find it interesting, though, that Thomas was not with the others when Jesus first appeared. Where was he? Where was Thomas when Jesus first appeared to all these other guys? All these other guys were hiding. Well, we know, according to the Bible, that they all scattered in fear. They scattered in fear, and I'm sure Thomas scattered right along with them. And maybe they just met back, and he hadn't yet figured out where they were. He could have ran to another town, there's all kinds of speculation there, but we understand he wasn't there, and many people question, why wouldn't he be there right then? Well, once again, that's God's plan. God's plan totally. We're told in the book of John that when they all appeared, Thomas was the only one that didn't see everything going on from the immediate start when Jesus first showed himself. It's a fact, without a doubt, that they all scattered and separated as we would do also. And one thing for sure is when we separate, just like 
promise here, when we separate ourselves from the community of faith, from brothers and sisters, we can miss many shared expenses, uh, shared experiences, not expenses. We can miss out on some blessings when we're not here sometimes together with the family on Sunday mornings. You can miss blessings that are headed your way. We can sure find God alone. We don't have to be with a big crowd to find God. That's a fact that we can surely find him. But we're most likely to always find him when we are in the midst of other believers that encourage us in our doubts and our faith. Now let's look at what Thomas's doubt was truly about. If you'll join me in John chapter 20, verse 24. Remember, this was after the crucifixion. This was after the resurrection where everybody's just scared. And all the uh, disciples were meeting in the upper room. And this is where Thomas shows up. John chapter 20, beginning at verse 24. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. <clears throat> Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have, been, have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So Jesus wanted to make a point here. You know, you saw me, you, you believe because you saw me. But why can't you believe without seeing me? What is it? Why is your face so stretched and so thin that you can't believe in me? Through all of this. You know, Thomas walked with Jesus. He saw miracles done. So did all the other disciples. Saw the miracles Jesus could do. So why did they why did they have doubt? Well, their faith got a little thin right there, got a little bit weak. And here, right here in this scripture, Thomas, he was doubtful, even though he knows the people around him very well. They're telling him what went on, what they saw, and he knows them very well, but he's still doubtful. He would gladly entrust any of these people that he's with, with his life. He knew them that well, yet he still couldn't find it in his heart to believe what they were telling him about the Lord. And he couldn't imagine that what they're saying was true. How could this be true? But if you notice in the scripture how Thomas deals with his doubt, he deals with it where he brings it out into the open. He's not hiding it from anybody. You know, he's bringing it right out to him without a problem. He doesn't believe it, and he says so. He's not going to just sit over there and act like nothing's going on, like I believe all of you because I do. He just said what he thought, and that's great. And sometimes when we are in doubt, we need to speak up and say, hey, we doubt that. It's okay. And it's okay to be wrong because many of us are wrong a lot of times, and we don't want to believe that. But Thomas, he, he just steps up there and basically says, hey, show me. If, you, if all this is going on, then show me. I want a little bit of proof. And, and to be honest with you, many of us would seek that also. We would want to see something that we could base our opinion on or, or what we're looking at on, right? We wouldn't want to just jump into anything. I don't know how that works with the disciples that walked with Jesus all the time and saw the miracles that happened. I, in that day, it was entirely different. Today, I think if we walked with Jesus and we saw all the miracles we could do, we would hang with him pretty tight. I'm not sure of that, but if something happened to him, would we scatter also? Probably many of us would. Not believing. But Thomas, he doesn't even leave the group. I mean, now he's the doubter. He's the outsider, right? He's kind of outside the group. He's the only one in the group that didn't believe what they were saying, so he's kind of the outsider, but he doesn't leave. He doesn't run from it. 
And he doesn't run from the problem that he doubts. He hangs in there. And he gives things time to work themselves out, which normally things do when we're in doubt. He's willing to be shown, but he's willing to wait until he is shown. Charles Spurgeon was the Billy Graham of his day. A story was told about a time that he was visiting a seminary and one of his students pleaded for a private audience with him. Once they were alone, the student confided that he had lost his faith. He, once they were, uh, uh, he spoke of the problem he had with the textual problems in the Bible, the way the Bible was written. He had problems with that. He had problems with what Scripture said even. He, he struggled with that. He had conflicts between science of today and the Bible at the time and a catalog of many other issues. He just had one doubt after another of what was going on. And Spurgeon's response was, Son, you haven't heard the half of it. Those doubts are child's play. When you've been a Christian as long as I have, you'll confront such large doubts that little problems like these won't bother you at all. Amen. When you become a Christian, you're going to be challenged. Satan's going to attack you. You're going to be challenged over and over again. Doubt will come into your head. Why is God doing this to me? Why is God allowing this to happen to me? Why doesn't God show up for me? You're going to have all those questions and all those doubts. Is there really a God? Well, that's where faith intercedes. Faith is what we know, not what we see. What we believe, not what's right in our face. Everyone has some kind of doubt. Everyone in their lives at one time or another. The heroes of faith in the Bible. We know all the heroes of faith in the Bible. They had doubts. Look at Abraham, the father of faith. He laughed. He laughed in disbelief when God promised to make him the father of all nations. He laughed because he didn't believe. He had doubt in that. Okay, maybe so. Sarah. Sarah laughed also. When she was told she's going to have a child at the age of 89, she laughed. She had a lot of doubt right there. And she had every right to believe so, right? Based on human things, right? Absolutely. And Moses, Moses, he doubted when God was sending him to free the people in Egypt. He doubted he was the guy for the job because he stuttered and he really didn't, didn't believe that he was the guy for the job. In Exodus uh, chapter 3, verse 11, Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? So he didn't have confidence in himself. He had some doubt right there. Well, each and every one of us are going to have that doubt. Our doubt can be like a fork in the road, right? We come up on a fork in the road, and we have to choose. We doubt, is this the right road? We doubt, is this the right road? So we're kind of caught right there in the middle. And we can use doubt as an opportunity to mature our faith, and grow in our relationship with the Lord, or we can use it as an excuse to isolate ourselves from others and pull away. We can do either. It just depends on where you are in your faith. Doubting Thomas became believing Thomas. They never changed his nickname, and all of us, once again, we know him strictly as Doubting Thomas, but he became believing Thomas because he stayed with other disciples in spite of, of his doubts. He hung in there. What am I trying to say to you today? How about this? Faith overcomes doubt in every case. Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, Jesus says right here, Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. And you go, wait a minute, I, I, don't, I don't know about that moving that mountain thing. The metaphor is the stronger the faith, the more power you have to, come over, to overcome the impossibilities in your life. And that's what Jesus is saying here. Faith's not a feeling. You, some people treat it that way, but faith is not a feeling. Faith is not performance-based at all. And faith doesn't mean we're going to get it all right. It doesn't mean that. Some people think, well, I'm a Christian. I, you know, I shouldn't be making these mistakes. Oh, yeah, right. Tell Satan that because he's trying to help you make all those mistakes. But faith can remove doubt. 
the stronger your faith, the stronger your relationship with Christ, the less you doubt about him personally and the things he says in his word in the Bible. When we find ourselves in doubt, what do we do? How do we overcome that doubt? Well, first of all, I'd say connect with God in prayer. Take it to God. and Lean on our faith to remove all the doubt because of that relationship we have with Jesus Christ. It goes hand in hand. We should know Thomas as Thomas the courageous believer. Thomas the inquisitive believer. And of course we'll always remember him as Thomas the doubter. But you have to remember he was inquisitive. Nothing wrong with that. But he did believe. Every one of us sitting here today will be challenged with doubt in our lives and with things like that. And it's okay to be inquisitive as Thomas was. But we do need to lean on our belief and our faith in Christ to help us overcome things in that situation. Thomas may have had had his doubts, for sure. But he also had great faith in Jesus Christ. And we'll find ourselves also having many doubts today and in the days to come. Once again, I tell you, leaning on your faith helps us overcome all those doubts in our lives. It helps us gain a clear picture of what's about to happen in our life as we refer to God's word, reading our Bibles, and connecting with God. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you today and lift this day to you, Father. We are thankful for the rain that nourishes our crops. Father, be with us today as we go forth into this next week. Father, we uh, thank you that you have given us a choice where we will make doubts, have doubts in our lives. But, Father, we're thankful that we have your son, Jesus Christ, to lean on in our faith and his promises, Father, that will help us overcome the doubtful situations in our lives and lead us in a direction that might be better for us. Father, I challenge each and every one here today, Father, that they might seek your word throughout the Bible. Pick up those Bibles and read them and get comfortable with how to get rid of doubt in their lives and problems and burdens in their lives and how to handle them. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be here. We thank you for this beautiful building and your presence being felt. Father, I pray that everything we said and did here today was uplifting, glorifying, and pleasing to you. And we ask this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.